we are going to do one example using fixed exchange rates. That's um, some of the material we learned last time on X to get a chance to use it. And then we're going to learn about international balance of payments, which is when you hear about things like a trade deficit or a trade surplus, this is what it's referring to. So first let's do that fixed exchange rate example. So until 2010, China targeted a fixed exchange rate of approximately 6.8 yuan to $1. For each of these scenarios, determine how, chi how would China respond to maintain that fixed exchange rate. So again, until 2010, China used a fixed exchange rate. Let's suppose that trade restrictions on Chinese products are lifted, so Americans are free to purchase more Chinese products. Good. The answer here is A, that de demand for yuan increases. Americans will demand more yuan so they can purchase Chinese goods. Pretty straightforward. Well, there. Okay. So again, the answer is increases. Next one. In response, so China will increase or decrease the supply of yuan by buying or selling U.S. bonds. Uh, remember, China wants to hold the exchange rate constant. So based on the last question, we said there's an increase in demand for Chinese currency. So how are they going to respond? So the answer here is A. And let's see why that is. Well, first thing that happened was that demand shifted was that demand shifted to the right and we said that would ha that's what happened when um, trade restrictions were lifted US people could buy more stuff made in China all right so increase in the demand so that means we move from this point up to here okay then what that means is in order for China to keep that exchange rate constant right here, China needs to move the supply to the right in order to push the exchange rate back down. Think about it as we started off here. The increase in demand moves us up to here. Now we need some way to move us back down to here, and that's done by increasing supply. Okay. So, how are we going to do that? How are we going to increase supply? Well, China is going to purchase bonds with yuan, putting more yuan into the market and increasing supply. So, you think about China's got this uh, bunch of yuan over here and wants to get out in the market. One of the ways it could do that, again, is just sort of fly over everyone's house and drop bills out. Instead, what they're going to do is sell a bunch of yuan, put a bunch of yuan in the market, and do this by buying US dollars, by buying US bonds. So think about it. yuan goes out into the market, US bonds go back to China's central bank. And this is actually a good representation of things that have really happened. Uh, China now holds over a trillion dollars in US government debt. Remember, bonds are a form of government debt, right? If you buy a bond, that's buying an IOU from the government. Example two, a recession occurs in China and the Chinese government uses expansionary monetary policy in response. This means that government shifts the money supply left or right, which would push the price of yuan up or down. So what we have here, the recession occurs if the government wants to use expansionary monetary policy that means it's going to increase the money supply or shift the money supply to the right. Now, expansionary monetary policy, this is done to encourage investment by lowering the interest rates. Well, a, a side effect of it is going to be that it's also going to affect the exchange rate. So when the money supply shifts to the right, shifts out, that is going to push exchange rate down. So again, government increases the supply of currency. As a result, 
that pushes the price or the exchange rate down. Next one. The expansionary monetary policy will push the exchange rate down, as we said. In order to maintain the exchange rate, the Chinese central bank will need to increase or decrease the supply of yuan on the exchange market by buying what, using what? The answer here is D, and let's see why. And like I said, it's sort of a, a weird result. Uh, the monetary policy, the expansionary policy will push the exchange rate down. So that's where we are here. This is post expansionary monetary policy. That's where we are. Supply and demand intersect at an exchange rate below where we want it to be. Well, like we said, the only, the tool that the government has to, to, to if they want to maintain a fixed exchange rate is to adjust the supply of money. Well, the only way for them to get the supply of money back up is to decrease the supply of money, shift it to the left. How do we do this? Well, what we need to do now is we need to get yuan out of the markets, right? So we need to reduce the number of yuan that are floating around in the world. So the way we do this is by, we find banks and other people who are holding yuan and we say, I'll give you dollars in exchange, give me yuan. And that is how we would expect. And then the central bank now can gather all those yuan together at bought and again, throw them in the fire, put them in the vault, whatever. Say throw them in the pile, put it, put it in the vault. Like it doesn't matter. They could burn the money up. They could not burn it up. I remember there was a exam we did and uh, when I was in grad school and they were talking about like you have these agents and you're saving and something I just remember, suppose we have a number of infinitely lived agents, and then it's said in parentheses, or they could die randomly. It doesn't matter. Thinking, it certainly matters for the people involved if you're either living forever or just randomly one day dying. Maybe it doesn't matter for the problem. I don't know. It was a really funny uh, caveat to put in there. So essentially what happened was they got, we started here. Then we moved down to here when we tried to do expansionary monetary policy. Then we realized that mex messed up our fixed exchange rate, so we have to go right back to where we started. Right back to where we started. Okay. So here is that sort of uh, tension I mentioned. The previous example shows how countries with a fixed exchange rate cannot determine their own monetary policy. Why is that? Well, Expansionary monetary policy means you're going to increase the money supply. And increased money supply is going to lower the price of your currency. So once that happens, in order to increase the price of your currency back to the fixed exchange rate you're targeting, you need to reduce the money supply, shifting you right back to where you started. All right, so balance of payments. Balance of payments, we're gonna think about imports and exports here. So you think about a balance sheet. Well, we take our balance sheet for the United States and we've got money flowing out, when, like when you, you know, buy a Toyota made in Japan. Money flowing in, like when we sell a Boeing airplane. And this right here is a kind of nice little graphic of imports and exports. You can see them when I post the slides. Um, main export partner for the United States, Mexico and Canada. Um, followed by China. So you see about 27% like of our exports go to the two neighbors. Okay. Um, what do we export? Main exports, uh, refined petroleum. So the United States now produces and refines enough petroleum that we're some major export. Um, cars, airplanes, things like that. Okay. U.S. has 2.16 trillion in imports. Um, by far, the largest import partner is China. 22% uh, of our imports come from China. Followed by Japan in Asia, and then next two largest um, overall are Mexico and Canada. What are we importing? We're importing things like cars, uh, computers, crude petroleum, I believe this is like package medication, things like that. Okay. 
again, it's just an overview. Um, so we'll think overall about the size of world trade. So the United States has an annual GDP of a little less than 20 trillion. And we have 1.25 trillion in exports, 2.19 trillion in imports. And so when you hear about people talking about, you know, the U.S. trade deficit, you know, how we're losing to China in some sense, um, this is usually the kind of thinking of. Uh, what we're going to see in this class and next is that this really the exports imports is not like a scoreboard or something. Let me be honest, just because this went viral. Okay. This is fucking... I did have a Pinterest account. <laughs> but so my you don't tell me you are all right, I muted you, but if you want to tell me more about your Pinterest account, you can unmute yourself. It sounds interesting. You know, my uh, only experience as a, an internet troll came on Pinterest. I was like, I thought it would be funny to like go in, like enter Pinterest and like say snarky things about people's recipes that I didn't like. And so I tried it and it was, I don't know. It's definitely better there than like Twitter. Or, fa or the Facebook group that I was a part of uh, when I joined the Facebook school group. It was horrible. Pinterest, much nicer group. Um, so anyway, if you're going to... Sort of like... Internet troll minor leagues. Whereas... Um, Facebook apparently is the majors, which I was not ready for. <clears throat> oh, I didn't kick that person off. I, I actually think they muted themselves. Um, I was getting ready to mute them. I'm not going to kick you out if you accidentally unmute yourself. So it is useful to think about what the United States is importing and exporting and how much of it. Again, we're not going to, we're going to see, this isn't like a winning and losing, but it's a nice thing to know. Um, the balance of payments accounts are a summary of a country's transactions with another country for a given year. During class, uh, we're going to focus on the transfers of money. This is just like a, an aside. In the textbook, you might see some talk, talk about transactions and stuff moving around. Whatever, As always, what we do in class, what's in the workbook, that's going to be the material you note know, for the exam. So we're going to start small and think about the balance of payments for a family. The balance of, and again... Um, we're going to think about balance of payments. So where is the family's money going and coming from? We're going to have our family business be Shroot Farms. And Shroot Farms last year made $100,000 selling beets. We spent $70,000 on running the farm, including the purchase of a tractor. And another 40000 on personal expenses, such as buying food and repairing a Pontiac Trans Am. Received 50000 in interest on their bank account, paid 10000 in interest on their mortgage, took out a new $25,000 loan to help pay for farm improvements, spent most of that, put 5500 in the bank. So we have all the different places that our money got came from and how we spent it and what we did with it. All right, so let's take this and we'll think about the Shroot Farms balance of payments. So we're going to have this table here. And this is going to show three different places we could, three different um, buckets where all the money we spend or get is going to come from. And we're going to call it sources of cash. That's the money coming in. And uses of cash, which is the money going out, the way we're spending it. And for each of these, we could figure out a net, which is this, just the how much we had coming in how much we had going out. So let's go item by item. Made $1,000 selling beets. Well, that is sales of a good. So that is a source of cash on this line, beet sales. Spent $70,000 running a farm, including the purchase of a tractor, and another $40,000 in personal expenses, such as buying food and repairing a Pontiac Trans Am. So we look at all, you know, at the end of the year, where'd all our money go? Well, we bought a tractor, we fixed the car, we bought some food. Total spending was 110. Notice that our net is 100,000 minus 110. So overall, if you were, you know, standing there watching all the money spent, all the money coming in on goods and services, you'll see that 
Shrewd Farms was $10,000 in the red on that category. They were negative $10,000 there. Next, we can look at interest payments. We received $500 in interest on our bank account and paid $10,000 in interest on the mortgage. So $500 source of cash here, $10,000 use of cash here. So if we're sort of looking at my relationship with the bank, overall interest-wise, I paid them a net of $9,500 in interest, right? They sent me $500, but I had to send them $10,000. Next one, loans and deposits. Took out a new $25,000 loan to help pay for farm improvements. So this is a source of cash for me. The bank just sent me some money. Then we have uses of cash. Well, I spent most of it and put $5,500 in the bank. And if you remember, think about it. This is me borrowing from the bank. And when you deposit money, that is depositing money. That is you loaning money to the bank. So net, I borrowed $19,500. And we can total this, and note, look what we see. I, my sources of cash were $125,500. My uses of cash were $125,500. So that's good. We, all of our money got used somewhere. And notice, that doesn't mean that it is, um, That doesn't mean that we spent all the money because one of the uses is putting money in the bank. So it's just saying all the money went somewhere, including the possibility that you saved it and just put it in the bank. Um, all right, we can do the same thing here. We take our negative 10,000, negative 9,500, add in positive 19,500, and it gives us a net of zero. So what does it mean to have a net of zero? I actually know of a faculty member who does his lectures on Twitch instead of Zoom. And I asked him why, and he said it was because of the emojis. I thought it was like a funny reason. He's like, yeah, I'm trying to get people to talk more. And I'm like, yeah, I did not need my chat to go any more off the rails. Had to rein it in a couple of times. He doesn't have 350 people in his class. So. Anyway, so maybe I will... Now, I should have some sway with Zoom now that I'm using it so much that maybe I can, uh, you know, I'll tell them they need to add back emojis and not just, you know, the thing where I could have a pirate hat or something. You also can... Um, Give yourself like eyebrows, a beard. This is something new. You can change the color of your eyebrows and give yourself a beard of any color. I had like we were, I had like a blue beard. Oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't even describe all this. I was so into the emojis. So the rightmost column is the net cash flow for each type. Bottom rows, total money in, total money out. And we know that they're equal to each other because all money has a source and all money gets used somewhere. So now we will look at balance of payments. I'm, there's bots? I thought I was just like, whatever, the bots are, I would have assumed the bots were Betty better than me. <laughs> like if, if they were like, oh, you're up against bots, I would have used that as like, well, of course I lost, I was playing bots. Of course I lost, I was playing seven-year-olds. All right, so now we're going to look at the United States. And we are going to do, um, we are going to do something, a similar table. We're going to have the different buckets that our spending and buying go in. And we're going to have money going out, money going in. So for the United States, payments from foreigners is going to be credits. Payments to foreigners is going to be debits. And so first we have sales and purchases of goods and services. And so when you're thinking about trade deficits, this is sort of the, the, the top line number. This is the one that looks the scariest as we're going to see. So payments from foreigners, that's going to be money that people spend to buy stuff made in the U.S. 
So purchases of goods is going to be things like U.S. wheat exports. We also can have purchases of services. Um, that's going to be things like fees paid by foreigners to U.S. consulting companies. That's them importing a service. Payments to foreigners include oil imports. So that's, again, we're paying for, for oil made, uh, made in another country, buying an iPhone made in China, buying a car made in Japan, and so on. Uh, also includes fees U.S. companies pay to Indian call centers. So that's importing a service. Next thing is factors of income, which is income paid for the use of factors of production. So here we're going to be thinking more along the things of businesses and um, um, purchase um, sort of the money that flows from a business in the process of it making money around the world. So, all right, what's the money? What's the money for business that comes from the other, other countries to the United States? Payments from foreigners include things like Profits earned by Disneyland Paris or the salary earned by an American consultant while overseas. So you think about this, this consultant is a factor of production. Payments to foreigners, that's going to include things like profits from a Toyota plant in Indiana. So Toyota came here, Toyota came here, they built a plant in Indiana. They may have manufactured my Camry. At least one of my cars is made in the United States. At least one of the Toyotas is made in the United States. I think it's the Camry. Um, Anyway, and so they set up the factory here, the factory earns money, money goes back to Japan. I've driven so little. I guess we drove, we had that long drive a few weeks ago. I think, I mean, I don't think I, I think from March to May, I probably drove a total of 25 minutes or something. I was afraid I was going to forget how to drive, but it hasn't happened. Although I think I, I'm more concerned that I've forgotten how to drive a stick. Um, I, I, I haven't owned a stick in like eight years. I've probably driven one like two or three times since then. So just too bad when I, especially when I get that Ferrari super fast, I'm going to have to learn how to drive a stick shift on a $330,000 car. Although I'm guessing the, the, most of those have paddle shifters now. All right. So, so we have sales and purchases, factor income and transfers. So transfers are going to be, this is money that you're not sending in exchange for something. You're just sending it, you know, to someone you know. So, for example, payments from foreigners. So, and I guess probably from foreigners is not the right term. Payments from a foreign country is going to things like payments sent home from Americans who live and work abroad. And payments to foreigners that includes uh, most commonly what are, what are known as remittances. That's payments that immigrants send to families in their country of origin. So a lot of this is going to be um, people living in the United States from Mexico and elsewhere in Central America who are sending money home to their families. All right. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to put this up on Top Hat, but um, I will briefly um, go through it. So a family sells carrots to Canada for a hundred and then sends the money to his family in Mexico. How does this affect the current account? Well, the first thing that happens is that he sells goods to carrots to Canada. That is the sale of goods and services. So that means money is going to the United States. So that is a credit to sales and purchases of goods. Next, all right, sends the money to his family in Mexico. That's a remittance. So that goes into transfers. And so that is money going from the United States. So that's a debit in the transfers part. So again, a credit of $100 to the sales and purchases of goods and services and a debit of $100 to transfers. Combined, these payments give the current account balance. <clears throat> so again, the current account is what we think about is money going back and forth. Um, what we're going to see is we're going to compare that with what we're going to call a finance, which is going to um, what we're going to think about separately, which are asset sales and purchases. So here is you are purchasing, not you are buying like a business. You're making an investment. And so what is that going to look like? Payments from foreigners, that's going to be investors making investments in the United States. That could be 
Chinese investors purchasing American companies, or it could be European investors buying American treasuries. <clears throat> so you could be, you know, buying a buying a company or buying a treasury or you know a bond from the United States. Both of these are going to be think are going to be considered asset sales and purchases. Payments to foreigners, well, that's going to be American investors purchasing Chinese companies or American investors buying European treasuries. So again, it's Americans putting, sending their money overseas for investments. So the most cited number when you hear about trade balance is usually the current account balance. That's often simplified to current account. And so when someone talks about the US trade deficit, this is usually what they mean. Sometimes you'll actually see them just talk about this top number, the goods and services one, um, that's usually if you're trying to make, again, sound worse. Um, this number is going to be less negative just because the United States um, is positive in factor income. It's generally a, uh, you know, we, we um, have, it's, it's a good place to do business. So companies like Toyota will put factories here. It was a legitimate win. I beat 99 real people and I don't like to hear, I don't want to hear anything else. I don't have a lot going for me right now. <laughs> All right, so, so we see United States, we have a negative 481 here. P uh, financial account, United States is very much in the positive. A lot of that is going to be because people from all over the world buy US treasuries. So let's think a little more about this. Like with Shrewd Farms, all money has a source and a destination. So let's suppose Best Buy buys a million dollars in electronics from Japan and sells them in its American stores. Well, the U.S. current account balance goes down by one million dollars, right? So that is goods and services, million dollars in the United States going to Japan in exchange for stuff. Okay, well, this is where it gets interesting. What does the Japanese factory do with that money? So if you think about it, it now has 1 million American dollars. So what are some options? Well, they can purchase US made equipment, which would, in, so one option is, all right, you know what? We got our million dollars. So we're gonna send that right back to you because we're building a new factory and some of the robots and stuff that go into the factory are made in the United States. Well, if they do, that will increase the US current account balance because that's purchases of goods and services. Um, we could buy you, they could buy U.S. savings bonds, which would increase the financial account balance. They could put the money in a U.S. bank. So maybe, you know, we just take the profits that we, money we get from the United States, put it right in a U.S. bank. Well, that will increase the U.S. financial account balance. Because if you think about it, what they've done is they, their investment here is that they loaned money to a bank in the United States. Again, that would be going, money going from Japan to the United States, that's increased the financial account balance. Or they could put the money in a Chinese bank. And so if you think about this, well now what they're doing is they've taken US dollars and they're holding on to them in, in, in Japan or China. They could keep them, you know, you could keep the cash in your mattress, you know, under your pillow or something, or you could put it in the bank. Now this is kind of interesting. You could actually think of this as an investment in US currency which is an asset because the reason I said this is weird is if you remember the dollar bill, the top of a dollar bill says um, Federal Reserve note. And so what that means is the dollar bill is actually a note or an IOU from the Fed. So it's similar to the idea, right? If you own $1,000 in Federal Reserve bonds, that means you can get $1,000. That means you're entitled to $1,000. Well, if you own $1,000 in bills, that's essentially the fact that the Federal Reserve sort of owes you $1,000. I mean, you have the cash for it, you can spend it. So anyway, what would the main takeaway here is that when you're holding US cash, you're actually, you can think about that as investing in US currency. So here's what we're trying to get out of all this, is that whenever you take that, whenever Best Buy gets that money or whenever the, the Japanese factory gets that money, they got to do something with it. Right? Even again, even if they just hold on to it as cash, that means they've invested in US currency. So 
all money gets used somewhere. And what that means is that the current account balance, the negative 1,000 from the United States, and the financial account balance, whatever the Japan does with it, so either this is negative a million and this is positive one million, so that's if they take the money and invest it, or this could be start off with negative one million from the, the electronics, but maybe they spend that money back in the United States to buy equipment, in which case this is negative a million plus positive a million, which means the overall impact to the current account is zero. We know that the overall impact to current plus financial is equal to zero. All right, so the only thing there is one um, uh, flow chart in the book. The only thing you really need to note it there. Um, so what, what I'm trying to show here is that money flows from the United States to the rest of the world. And the way it does this is we can either spend by stuff, so financial account, I'm sorry, we can either buy businesses in the financial account, make investments, or we can send, send our money over to the world in exchange for stuff, or again, just to be nice. So those are all the ways the money goes from the United States to the rest of the world. Well, the rest of the world doesn't really have, you know, an interest in holding these U.S. dollars. So often what we will see is money going. So we will see the, what does the um, rest of the world do with their dollars? Well, they can buy U.S. stuff. That's the red. Or they can buy U.S. assets. That's the green. I think there's a typo in the book and it should say U.S. here. Um, so main takeaway again, this flow chart is that current account balance plus financial account balance should equal zero.